Whenever I walk on that crunchy gravel path, I remember the fellows in outer space outfits that came from the EPA and seeing them walking through these fields of kudzu and privet and sampling the dirt they could dig down and get to. And then now that they're gone, it's gorgeous. And you know, when you don't see something, it's easy to miss it. So I'm really reveling in the fact that I don't see that stuff anymore. It's gone. I'm Kate Tucker, and this is Hope Is My Middle Name, a podcast from Consensus Digital Media. Today, we get to talk with Sally Sears, a lifelong journalist and one of the founders of South Fork Conservancy, a group dedicated to restoring the banks of the South Fork of Peachtree Creek in Atlanta, Georgia. I first learned about Sally after reading the incredible story of Zona Light Park, which is on Peachtree Creek. The park, it used to be a wasteland of sorts. The EPA actually classified it a brownfield. It was contaminated by asbestos and overrun by invasive plants. And it sat there for years, right in the middle of everything. Until Sally and a group of super dedicated volunteers decided to reclaim their watershed for the wildlife, for the community, and for the future. I love the story of how Zonalite Park came to be. And I loved, loved, loved talking to Sally. As you'll hear, her passion, wonder, and respect for wild places is absolutely infectious. Oh, hi, Sally. Hey, Kate. I am so happy to hear your voice. Likewise, I've been dying to hear the story of how you pulled off what you did down there in Georgia. But before we get too far, I know that you've done a lot of restoration. So we're talking about restoring a whole creek bed and landscape and miles and miles of parkland in an urban area. So I'd like to first start with the destruction aspect of that. You guys have to go in there and rip out a bunch of plants that are taking over the creek bed and kind of taking over the space for native plants to grow and thrive. So tell me, what is your favorite plant to just rip out of there and what goes into getting that out of there? Oh, my. Great question. I have a nice list of favorite enemy plants, but topping (laughs) that list has got to be kudzu. Kudzu, that import from over a century ago that everybody thought was going to stop soil erosion, but they hadn't dealt with the South's climate when they introduced it here. And it is truly, in some people's minds, the vine that ate the South. Uh, It's miserable because it just grows so quickly you can see it growing in the course of a day. And it forms knotty little nodules under the dirt. And to you can't just cut it and pull it. You have to kind of get at the nodule and yank it out or poison it, which is always a bad idea. So kudzu, number one enemy of creek bank (laughs) restoration. And probably number two is another Asian import called privet. Privet has a million seeds, no friends, and no enemies. So no birds want to eat it. So all these (laughs) berries keep floating downstream and finding new places to grow. And they block the sun because they keep their leaves on year round. Mm. So they take over like kudzu does in places that need sun for native plants to flourish. You know, kudzu, I love saying that word. What a great word, kudzu. (laughs) But kudzu, I read that it actually has taken over 7.4 million acres of U.S. land. Wow. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) that is outrageous. (laughs) Talk to me about native plants versus invasive. I mean, why even go in and do all that work in the first place? Why do we have to fight invasive plants on behalf of native? We have to fight for native plants because that's what bugs like and birds like and they're adapted to. The native plants that you put in is food for centuries for this part of the world. It's true all over the country that if you plant something that's always belonged there, you'll have more success rebuilding the bugs and the birds and the bees that make that a natural surround and habitat. We've got a plant here called crepe myrtle. It's not particularly bad. It's just nobody likes to eat it because it's not from here. When you plant something like elder blossom or elderberry, 
you can find half a dozen different kinds of bees buzzing around it. And that means that ultimately the birds will be eating the caterpillars that are being laid there by other bugs. You do have to be kind of vigilant to keep the invaders out because they don't have enemies. They don't have other birds in this environment or bugs that want to eat them, and so they grow more quickly. Hmm. That's why we really love a, a good palette of native plants and lots of different kinds of them that bloom at different seasons and that bear different kinds of berries. So the migrating birds will have this thing to eat when they come through. It's like milkweed in the monarchs. I think people are understanding the monarch migration better now than I did when I was young because we've been hearing a lot about the loss of monarchs, and that's in large mm -hmm. part the loss of milkweed. And mm. we've been planting milkweed up and down our creeks when we restore them. So there will one day be this ribbon of orange blooming oh, to yes. get the monarchs to stop on their way back <laughs> to Mexico that. in the winter and on their way up to Canada in the summer. So that's why we love native plants. Do you have a native plant society, you know, helping people understand what's happening down there? Oh, yes. The Georgia Native Plant Society has got lots of chapters all over Georgia. And of course, we're one of the most biodiverse states of the 50. So each section of Georgia has got lots of its own stuff. The coastal Georgia plants are a little bit different. There's 23 different kinds of milkweed alone in Georgia. And Kate, you know, I didn't know all this stuff. As a reporter, I never covered milkweed. I can say that. <laughs> But um, over time, this has just become a wonderful way to learn a lot of new things that are really important and meet a lot of people who've been caring about this for a long time. Hmm. Where did you grow up? In Alabama, in a beautiful part of the state, right in the middle where the Appalachians are just giving out. Hmm. And there was a lot of trees in a small town, a college town. And behind my house was woods and a creek. And between the woods and the creek was something we called the red dirt clearing. And on a winter day once, I came out early enough in the morning that there were ice crystals projecting from the clay. And I'd never seen anything like it before. They looked like toothbrush heads, the way <laughs> the crystals had forced their way up. And I thought, that is wonderful. You know, got mom and dad out to look at it. Nobody, you know, had ever noticed it before. And I thought, there's something out here that we don't all completely understand. How do we make this magic accessible? How do I follow this magic? How do other people get to see stuff that you wouldn't notice if it, you know, it warms up 10 degrees and it's gone? That red dirt clearing as a child taught me a lot about paying attention and showing what you find when you look very carefully at something. Hmm. Do you remember the first time you saw Peachtree Creek? Oh, yes. Peachtree is a beautiful creek until it gets really close to the Chattahoochee River, which is where I first realized how terribly the city of Atlanta and those of us who live here had neglected the sewers because those creeks, when it rains, fill up with sewage and I'll never forget one day out covering a pretty heavy flooding down there, the trees five and six feet above the water level were full of not just disposable garbage bags, but sanitary products, sewage, condoms, just awful stuff. I mean, it was terrific for news because you could demonstrate how wretched it is. But that was <laughs> when the city was finally coming to confront the fact that they had to spend serious billions of dollars repairing the sewers upstream. Those were among my earliest memories of Peachtree Creek was its terrible pollution, the neglect, the degradation, the indifference to what happens downstream as long as you've got clear water, you know? Mm. There were many wonderful champions who sued the city and the state to enforce the Clean Water Act. And they were joined by all the cities downstream from Atlanta, Columbus, mm -hmm. West Point, because if it leaves here that bad, it doesn't go away. It's heading merrily downstream, and it's gross when it lands. But those early images of Peachtree Creek stuck with me, and the fact that it has changed now by government action and by determined volunteers who went to court to force the government to act. Uh, strong reminders that we really do make a difference if we work together. Hmm. I want to hear about how y'all work together. So 
Zonalite Park on the South Fork of Peachtree Creek. It wasn't always a park. It was a brownfield some 15 years ago? Yes. So before it was a park, who was there? Who owned the land? What was the impact of those occupants? And how did it end up being so contaminated? All over the country in the 50s and 60s, they were making this industrial insulation. It was insulation that they were making out of a material called vermiculite. But this particular vein of vermiculite they mined from Montana, and it was contaminated with asbestos, and who cared? Nobody knew how bad asbestos was in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. When it started slowly coming to light how hazardous it was, That's when all of these plants that had taken vermiculite from that place started to close down and eventually went into bankruptcy. First they took the equipment away and then they shut the buildings down and then they scraped up the parking lot and shoved everything over with some good old, you know, Georgia red clay to seal it in place. Most of my earliest memories of this part of town was as an industrial park and worse. This was the place you went on the cheap if you wanted to get the oil changed in your car and just dump it out on the ground. I mean, yuck. It, was, it, was, it wasn't scary exactly. It was just industrial nowhere. Yeah. And slowly, a couple of abandoned warehouses caught the eye of some developers, and they put new roofs on them and uh, rented out some nice office space inside after they redid it, ignoring, as they should, all of the bad stuff on the other side of the railroad tracks. When we tracked down the course of the creek and realized that the polluter had gone into bankruptcy and abandoned these 12 acres, which meant that the county reclaimed them or they were sort of dumped in the county's lap, but nobody could use them because of the pollution. Mm -hmm. That's when we said, look, if these tenants, there were cartoon makers and industrial uh, honchos setting up headquarters in these beautifully restored old warehouse ethic kind of places, why can't we do something like that to the 12 acres that the public already owns. Mm -hmm. And that was the best part. It was already public land. But before you got anywhere, you had to get all the pollution out from under that clay. That was the trick. How do we get somebody to unseal this Georgia clay Mm. covering all these acres? And that's when the EPA came in and said, well, you know, this is bad down there, but as long as it stays sealed, the asbestos won't get free and float in the air. And then we said, well, what if we had a, you know, a community garden here and children were tossing the dirt in the air? And that's when the EPA said, ah, well, that's a bad idea. Let's see if we can't force the polluter to clean it up. That's how we got the pollution out. Uh, It wasn't sleight of hand. We meant it. We wanted a community garden there. And the EPA said, okay, yeah. And the county, DeKalb County, Georgia, gets great credit for its lawyers and the EPA's lawyers taking the culprit to court and forcing the bankruptcy judge to force them to pay to clean this stuff up. Two and a half million (laughs) dollars. Loved it. Wow. You had to go through a battle in court. I want to know more about who was involved in that and how it came about. We'd gotten going, I don't know, 2010, 2011 or so, something like that. So Gwendolyn Keyes Fleming, a woman who had been the district attorney for our county, knew Zonalite, knew that it was sitting there on the county's parks inventory, unused, and she as newly appointed head of the Southeastern EPA division, said, you know, that might not be a bad place to start. Now, I'm putting words in her mouth. I don't ever remember her (laughs) saying that. And she certainly wasn't doing any home cooking favoring, you know, where she'd come from. But between her and DeKalb County and volunteers on our board as lawyers said, you know, this is good. We should help with this. And they all together said, let's see what the polluter says. And, of course, if you're a company in bankruptcy, it's kind of hard to find you or to get to you. So it took the might of those national and local institutions of public service all saying, okay, this is worth fighting, and this land that we can recover is worth doing something with that people will want. There was one wonderful meeting. Oh, this was so fun, Kate. We had to have a meeting. Of course, all the lawyers had to have a meeting. I said, why don't we meet in the old headquarters of the company store? You know, the company where all the white-shirted guys sat telling the blue-collar guys outside how to make vermiculite into zonalite. Let's meet in the old company office because 
It had been turned into a Soto Zen home. Huh. Wow. So if we can meet in a place with all these lawyers who are sort of scrappy with each other, where there's a Soto Zen <laughs> attitude, maybe we can get something done. And we did. It was <laughs> great. <laughs> That's incredible. I heard a tell of a man with an Indiana Jones hat. <laughs> Well, yes, absolutely. His name is Billy Hall, and he was on our side. He was one of the founders with me and with Bob Kerr of the South Fork Conservancy. And when we had that meeting in the Soto Zen Center to keep all the lawyers less cranky, (laughs) he was a little bit late, and he came striding into the meeting with his hat on, fresh from the fields, because his work is remediation all over the world. He came striding in and he said, look here, we can do this, and here's what it'll take, and here's what it'll look like when it's done. And we all watched him as he came in. He unrolled a thick a circle of papers on the table, and everybody kind of got up and leaned in. It really was like we were looking at maps of the, you know, Lost Temple of Dender or something. <laughs> and if Billy hadn't worn that hat that day, I'm not sure the effect would have been nearly as strong. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point when you were in court, how long had it been that the land had been just lying fallow and contaminated? Oh, 20, 30 years. It just sat there. It's so close to the creek that it was a floodplain and would rain heavily. There would be pools and puddles all over. So nobody could get in there. And slowly the plants started to come back into the clay. But they were all these non-native invading plants. But it was reclaimable if you had the vision and the idea that you could make a difference to get to the creek. And that's where we started. We want to get to the creek. How do we get through this minefield of asbestos to do it? And that's when we really started concentrating on how do we fix the hazards? Who can pay to fix the hazards and get us on this crunchy gravel path that won't mess with the floodplain? And when it rains, it still floods up in there. But we built a beautiful pond that the birds just love to hold the water instead of lots of lumpy little pools. Of course, one of the neighbors said, well, now you're just going to build a pond and those mosquitoes are going to eat me up. At two weeks. <laughs> That's where the Audubon Society came in. They called it Georgia Audubon now. They've gone statewide. And they said, well, you know, the best trick for mosquitoes is birds eating the mosquito larva. Yes. So we had wonderful partners with a lot of really thoughtful naturalists saying, this is what'll help. And boy, has it ever. It's great. And then when you were successful, you kept the name of the park, the name of the contaminant. We kept the name of the park because it needed redemption. Yeah. Plus, it's highly memorable. I mean, if we called it Creekside Park, who would find it? You know, there's a lot of creeks. In it. <laughs> but I thought it was really important to redeem the name of that park, to put Zonalite on the map as a place that was worthy of restoration and that yields great benefits because it's restored. One day, while we were early in this, it had rained and the creek was a little bit high. And I went down to the bank and saw on the other side of the sandbar, the beach, this really dapper gentleman in waders with a stick in his hand with, uh, you know, pinchers on the end like you pick up trash with. And he was picking up rocks from the bottom of the creek. I thought, what is he doing? Who is this guy? He turns out to be Ph.D., He was, I think, as I remember, he was wearing a bow tie under his waders. And the pieces he was picking up, he'd throw most of them down, but every so often he would pick up one and really look look at it hard and tuck it in his pocket. They were pieces of pottery from the earliest peoples who lived on this creek, maybe 500, maybe 1,000 years ago. And they left their marks in pots and the art on those pieces. Some of them were inscribed with beautiful designs. And he, Dr. Ansley Abraham is his name, he called me over and I said, what are you doing? And he showed me some of these incised marks. And I have been a fan of it ever since because it reminds us how long that creek has been loved. Mm. So in the whole process, what do you think some of the bigger challenges were that you faced? Getting people to know that there's a creek in their neighborhood Do we, you know, send out brochures and put up billboards and say, come on down? Or do we let people find it? 
And if we let people find it, will will people find it who don't love it like we do? You know, I'm not suggesting they bring in privet or litter or anything, but how do we get other people to care for it like we care for it and then begin this nurturing process? I think everybody who works in this kind of world knows the benefit of volunteers because they make believers out of people that you couldn't reach otherwise. And Mm -hmm. we've been really lucky with neighbors volunteering and some of the big corporations in Atlanta, Delta, Cox, Coca-Cola, have all been wonderful. Uh, Home Depot have all helped us by sending 15 and 20 people at a time to plant things, to cut privet. In fact, it turns out privet, We cut every two weeks in the park, and every two weeks the uh, Atlanta Zoo comes, sends a truck, picks it up, and hauls off our cut privet to feed the giraffes at the zoo. (laughs) What? (laughs) You're kidding me. No, I'm not. I'm not, and I just love it. (laughs) (laughs) You're feeding the giraffes? Yes. With privet. And, oh, my gosh, that's so beautiful. That's so perfect. Okay. I'm fascinated by the idea that a few people could have such a transformative impact. I want to know how the South Fork Conservancy came together. Oh, well, that's a good one, because that one really goes back to Frederick Law Olmsted, the grandfather of Mm. landscape design. He laid out a linear park in what was then suburban Atlanta. This is the turn of the last century. And all those parks that he laid out had gotten so used and so loved that in the 1990s, a group formed to help restore those parks. And I was part of that group because we had a great blueprint What did Olmsted think was a good idea? Mm. Let's do that, Mm. you know? (laughs) (laughs) But there was one little piece that he had run out of money before he could do, and it had a creek running through it and a ravine in it. And over the hundred years, that ravine had filled with all kinds of bad things. And people who would camp out down there because it was a quiet, nowhere place Mm -hmm. with enough money, something like, I don't know, $10 $10 million, we restored a lot of that, built a lot of trails right alongside the creek, a, a very tiny creek going through the ravine that nobody could see. That creek, because it had a trail next to it, was suddenly visible to people, and they started using it. Mm. And that proved to those of us in the Olmsted Linear Park Alliance the value of eyes on the creek mm-hmm. could be the salvation of some of these urban creeks that had been so neglected and abused. So that was when we knew that if we could do that to Deep Dean Park, right there on Ponce de Leon Avenue in the middle of Atlanta, what if we did this for other tributaries of Peachtree Creek that were equally bad, that were already public land? And that's where it got really exciting because when we discovered that most of the way from Deep Dean all the way to Peachtree Creek's headwaters was public, because of sewer lines, we said, maybe we should form a group and do this. And that's what we did. It's incredible. It goes all the way back to Olmsted. I mean, what an amazing individual. And the history, just in his life alone, Mm -hmm. the way he has impacted our country. And when you look at how he created Central Park and what the state it was in when he came along, you know, it's just impossible to imagine that type of transformation being able to occur in one person's lifetime. Yes. So... To consider that he's still having an impact, you know, into the 21st century, that's just such an inspiration. And I love that you kind of picked up on that. And you're focusing on this one specific area. Was there a a personal connection for any of you three to uh, Peachtree and South Fork? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, if I spilled a Coca-Cola in my driveway, which I try not to do, but if I did, it would roll right down into Peavine Creek, and uh, half a mile later, it's in the South Fork, and three miles later, it's in Peachtree itself. So this is our watershed. And we all said, you know, we live here. We could make a difference internationally. We could make a difference nationally. We could lobby. We could vote. Or, in my case, we can get out there with clippers and yank (laughs) weeds and invite people to build very low-impact trails and walk along the banks of the creeks and look at the creek and feel, you know, your heart lift. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, definitely your heart lifts. I mean, it sounds like this is just a great public, private, volunteer, all, you're touching all the things. You've got grassroots, grass tops, all the people engaged. I mean, who are your other sort of government entities who are supporting or part of keeping this going? Well, the state of Georgia has been great, but Audubon 
and the Georgia Native Plant Society have been very good um, nonprofit supporters. But, you know, Kate, when you get going with government money, the park and rec folks have to compete with other huge needs in a community. And you do not want to get into a situation where, you know, you're fighting over scarce resources because then you're fighting against your neighbors who really wants the roads repaved. And it's hard. And that's where a lot of the tension comes in is how do you fund the things you want that is not at the expense of things that you also want? But then, you know, families do that all the time in their own budgeting. So, yeah. So as a journalist, you've covered so many stories and interviewed so many people who are doing the work of conservation and they've been doing it over the years. I'm curious how you have seen people successfully navigate those conversations that can be polarizing, but instead they help bring people together around a sort of um, shared goal that includes everybody's best interests in some way, and also, of course, the planets. Ooh. Well, glass half full, glass half empty is where the fight starts. I spent quite a bit of time telling people how terrible things were. The journalistic tendency to cover friction can make things harder. When you choose to cover the 20% that we do agree on, you end up getting somewhere because then people relax and they smile instead of Hmm. flexing their muscles against you. And I've also found the environmental community can be a real tough place where, you know, people Mm -hmm. fling around phrases like, don't let the good be the enemy of the best. And if it can't be wilderness, it's not going to be anything. And to heck with it, turn it into a parking lot. Those arguments just don't help. Yeah. And it just doesn't work, you know? Yeah. We've all got to acknowledge each other's shortcomings and see what we can do that we do agree on. It's hard. And a journalistic background is a reminder of a lot of things, that the urgent gets in the way of the important. And I hate that. Yes. (laughs) I need to hear that. That's something I certainly struggle with regularly. I was reading or listening to something that you had said about one of the challenges being getting people engaged and getting them to stay engaged. Because when you're just starting an initiative like that, there's all kinds of different ideas and people can go north, south, east, and west really fast. I was very opportunistic, you know, at first, and I probably still am. You know, when people say stick to your knitting, they don't acknowledge the fact that you're really not knitting. You know, who's knitted in a long time? (laughs) (laughs) But the creeks are everywhere, and it's all everywhere. How do you pick your piece of everywhere? I don't know. But once you start, sometimes I do think that just your successes will show you what the next step ought to be. Hmm. What is the next step for the South Fork Conservancy? Well, we've got five miles that we're almost finished. We've got some connections still to make. And then there's upstream. There's 25 miles upstream. And then, of course, there's other urban creeks that can benefit from this. There's a lot of neighborhoods that don't have enough access to the green space around them. There's usually plenty of green space. It's just not easy to get into or doesn't feel safe if you're in it does really come down to connection, doesn't it? Both physically, you're connecting the trails and the parks, but also with the people who have to come together in order to make it happen. Well, that's that's a challenge because if it's the creek in your backyard, you don't want people back there messing with it. And there's enough fear <laughs> among all of us of strangers in our front yard, let alone in our backyard, that it requires a lot of care, a lot of attention, a lot of listening, and also a lot of considering, well, maybe there's a different side of the creek we can put a trail on. I've seen this repeatedly in other organizations like the Path Foundation. They've got a trail that goes from Atlanta to Alabama, and that is pretty cool. And they struggled to get that built, and now it's exceedingly popular. But they would go through some places, and the neighborhood would say, well, we're not going to like this unless you build us a high wall. And we need a fence so we can get in there, but it's got to be a one-way fence. (laughs) And then after a few years, the fence isn't locked anymore because Mm. there's no hazard. And that's a large part of helping convince other people that it can work if people of goodwill agree. Mm. Well, Sally, I'm currently 700 miles north of you, but after a story like this, I have got to know 
what it's like to walk the banks of Peachtree Creek. Can you take me on a little journey through Zona Light Park? I mean, what would we see or hear or smell if we went on a walk today? I can hear our feet crunching on the gravel as we walk through a little fringe of woods and enter the meadow that the Environmental Protection Agency forced the polluting company to clean up with their own money. (laughs) That was so great. So now, Kate, you and I are walking into a a green meadow that is edged with native plants that we put back, blueberries and some blackberries, and there is a community Mm -hmm. garden on the edge that we'll walk past. And in the little gazebo in the community garden, somebody is probably out having some iced tea. And when I was there yesterday, Mm -hmm. a fellow showed up with a bouquet of flowers to congratulate his honey on her master's degree that she was earning that day. So Mm -hmm. they told me they'd been married there a year ago. I thought, my God, 15 years ago, this place (laughs) was a brownfield, and now you're getting married here? Whoa. Uh, Once we walk through the meadow, we cross a a little footbridge, and we're in the woods with, I don't know, 15 or 20 different kinds of trees, hickories and walnuts and pecans and, oh, lots of oaks and maples. There's an Irish music instrument society here that they come out to Zona Light and play on Saturday mornings sometimes. And I think, oh. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, enchanting. These gorgeous old instruments. And here they are, you know? Wow. Coming out of nowhere to come play together in the forest. Whoa. If we take a left, we're going to go along a crunchy path down to the beach, which is really a sandbar, but we love to call it a beach because it's so unlikely that there would be beaches (laughs) in the middle of Atlanta, you know? But as you and I are walking, Kate, we're passing today beautiful blooms of the elder bush, elder blossom, elderberry, Mm -hmm. and it smells just perfumey, perfumey. Keep on going downstream, and, and we've got a good loop that you can make and come back up through a little upland that um, volunteers have helped to build through the woods, and they've planted it with native azaleas. So next year, or maybe it'll take three years, those native azaleas will bloom, and they smell good. So we got a lot of good smell. How's that? You liking that? It sounds so magical. (laughs) I, I mean, and you're telling me this is in Atlanta. Yes. Like in the city. <laughs> yes. You're maybe three miles from two major interstates that meet here. You know, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is about half a mile away. So we get these scientists who are in there wrestling with some of the world's scariest oh, yeah. bugs. And they come down here for a picnic or just to get away mm. from the lab. Emory University is right there. And this is a respite for them that didn't exist until we started paying attention to how to restore a creek. For you, when you go there, is there anything that's just extra special to you that maybe someone else might not notice, but maybe it's something that that you're drawn to or something that you have a connection with? Whenever I walk on that crunchy gravel path, I remember... The fellows in outer space outfits that came from the EPA to prove that it was hazardous. And seeing them walking through these fields of kudzu and privet and sampling the dirt they could dig down and get to. And then now that they're gone, it's gorgeous. And you know, when you don't see something, it's easy to miss it. So I'm really reveling in the fact that I don't see that stuff anymore. It's gone. Wow. One of the things I love about these conversations is I get to kind of have this glimpse into someone else's lived experience, and it gives me so much hope just to see the transformative work that's being done. And and I think about what you're doing as a potential model for other communities, other cities. Where have you seen work like this happening across the country? Have you been in touch with other municipalities and kind of compared notes? And and how do you think what you're doing could be replicated? Ooh. Here in Georgia, I think we've gotten really helped by looking at the example in New York City of the High Line, where They took a railroad line that was elevated, and then they had some really forward-thinking landscape architects who said, look, this is grim. Plants that can grow on a railroad overpass have got some real tenacity. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) no kidding. And Chicago's done the same thing with with the strip 
of restored stuff. And in Atlanta, it's the Beltline. And the folks who are planting along Atlanta's Beltline, which is a circle of connected railroad tracks, have found the same idea that we've done on the creeks, on the riverine structures of Atlanta. It's different kinds of plants, of course, but it's also mostly public land. So those ideas are complementary I'd love to know if somebody in Idaho is doing this. You know, Minneapolis does a lot of this. And I don't know how I would encourage somebody else to do it except to say, where's your creek? If you don't know the name of your creek, if you don't know the name of where your Coca-Cola rolls down into, then maybe that's a good place for you to start. Mm. It's interesting to think of the sort of identity a trail or a park can give a place. I mean, tell me about the neighborhoods that are benefiting from this how are people engaging? You know, what different communities are coming in and using the park in a way that's kind of bringing those groups or those people to life? So many people say, oh, I grew up in that creek. These are people over the age of 50. I grew up throwing (laughs) rocks in that creek. I'm so glad that now I can get my children or my grandchildren down there. But for every five of those people, somebody of the same age group says, I never knew there was a creek down there. Mm. And that's the person who brings a child or a grandchild and watches them learn how to skip a rock. I've got a friend whose nephew didn't know how to skip a rock, and that kid was nine years old. And I thought, what a pity, you know? He's missed five or six years of his life (laughs) chunking rocks. And my friend was just so thankful that she didn't have to drive far to get him there. Hmm. It was in the neighborhood. These are in all of our neighborhoods. We got lost with this car stuff, Kate, here in Atlanta. I mean, a sprawl city, a place where at one point people said, well, why do we need sidewalks? Everybody's going to have a car. You're not going to want to walk. I think that was somebody walking in July and August who came up with that idea. And that's why so many of the, (laughs) the, the neighborhoods don't have parks in them. And why they do have creeks in them, but nobody knows the creeks are there because they're so busy driving across them. If we've let them go and don't know that they're there, well, shame on us. Go find it. You don't need a map. You just kind of watch water roll downhill and see (laughs) what's neglected and how you can help it because it really isn't that hard to get started. And when people see you doing it, they often want to help. Hmm. At the end of the day, what do you think you personally take away from this work and for this work being the work of nature? It's a purpose. It's a unifier. It's we're not here alone. We are here as part of something bigger. I spend an awful lot of my time thinking, I'm an American. I'm independent. I can do this. But it's not really true. And when you can help a little thing like a creek, you start to see some of those intertwining connections that make for a much more rich life for yourself as well as for the world around you. And you inspire other people to do it too. What does sustainability mean to you? That it'll be there tomorrow. That this isn't just working one meal at a time. That this is a feast that's gonna continue. And that if we all bring a piece of ourselves to it, we can make it last for good. And I would love to have a Southern feast with you. Let me tell you, <laughs> I was already, <laughs> I was already fantasizing about like mint juleps or sweet tea on the porch in the South. I just miss the South so much. Oh. I would love finally just to hear what's bringing you hope these days. I. I'm glad you asked that. You remember a piece you did recently with the gentleman in the bayou in Houston and how he was out there with his boat. Loved that. Loved that. He's out there sucking up all this garbage. I wondered, what would it take to get us to change our ways and have less garbage rolling into the bayou? So how do you do that? Well, what happens when people change their habits? And I think about smoke detectors, and I think about seat belts. All of those things have been just in the last several decades, changed and saved lives. It's like, how do we get trash out of the creek? How do we change? Do we get rid of styrofoam? That's a hard one. Do we get rid of single-use plastic? That's a hard one. But we've done it with other things. Somebody smart is going to figure this out, and we're all going to benefit, and we're going to change our ways, because we can change our ways, because we've done it before. 
Mm, I love that. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure. I am just so grateful to get to spend this time with you. Thank you, Sally. (laughs) Thank you. This has been fun, and I hope you will let me know when I can put the sweet tea on and get the porch swing ready for you. A great big thanks to Sally Sears for sharing the incredible story of a park and creek reclaimed, restored, and loved now by so many. For more on how they did it and what's ahead, visit SouthForkConservancy.org. Hope is My Middle Name is hosted and executive produced by me, Kate Tucker. You can find me on Instagram at Kate Tucker Music, and if there's someone you think belongs on the show, please send me a message. This episode was produced by Christine Fennessy with editing from Rachel Swaby. Our production coordinator is Persia Verlin. Our sound designer and engineer is Scott Somerville. Music by the fantastic artists at Epidemic Sound, Soundstripe, and me. Big thanks to Connor Gaughan, our publisher and visionary at Consensus Digital Media. Hope is My Middle Name can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It would mean a lot to us if you would follow, rate, and review the show. Hope is My Middle Name is a podcast by Consensus Digital Media, produced in association with Reasonable Volume. See you next time. <laughs>